And just so we, we know where to go. Like, so we gave it to us in a linear possession, progression, but we know that it's, it's actually, it, these, are, these are all working together. And the first thing is to recognize the real problem. So in doing that, can someone please tell me what, um, oh, I've got to go through all my slides. Okay, that's okay. Uh, can someone tell me what, um, it's right, I'll cruise. Um, can someone tell me what, um, what are we trying to cultivate and recognize the real problem? Honesty. Honesty. Just tell the truth. Get honest about what you want. Get honest about your own thing. You know what is a great exercise? If you've got safety, if you've got a, um, if, if you're married and you've got a spouse you can talk to, if you're single and you've got a friend you can talk to that uh, on a real level, that you could actually say, so, so can we talk through this? I just got mad and I want to talk through this. Um, or if you have the safety margin to say, so what did you want in that? What, what was going on in there? Uh, what did you want? And just help the person really uh, figure out what was the desire, what do they not believe about God, and um, how is it that they love their sin more than they love Jesus? Because when we actually see that, then true repentance can be worked in. Um, how many of you have ever said sorry before you were sorry, right? Um, I find that sometimes repentance is a, is a maturing thing. Like you maybe can start, oh, Lord, forgive me. And it's like God gives you grace to actually repent then. Like you start with a sorry, and then you really get sorry. Um, yet at the same time, we can force for a repentance moment when somebody hasn't really connected the dots. Um, you, ever, you ever told your kids, say sorry? Like, sorry. They're sorry, aren't they? They are genuine. <laughs> But on the other hand, have you, ever, have you ever had one of those moments where one of your kids was just really busted up? Uh, we were, this is a long time ago. Um, we were speaking so as me and Christy. No, we didn't have a team with us. And she came back to the trailer after the service. And she was just, she was, you know, you could see the fire in her eyes. And she's like, your son. You know, you know, the, you know when your parent talks about it being yours, you know. Um, and my son, I, I, my oldest boy, uh, he, wow, 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 wow. I mean, he's been, always been strong. And I mean, so he's like three or four, and he just, he's like, mom's doing the children's program. And you know, we worked with our kids specifically about learning how to sit and when to sit and all this kind of stuff. But he chose that he was not going to sit, and he's just running around. The, she's teaching. She's, she's, and it was, it was a real small church somewhere. She's the only one. He's running around. Can't believe it. He's never done. Why is he doing that? She's telling him to sit down. He's not sitting down. I, I, I pull him aside and that evening. We got him on. I go, what was going on? And he goes, I wanted to run. <laughs> and I'm like, your mom was telling you to sit down. Yeah, I know, but I wanted to be with my friend. Like he had no problem like just telling you straight up. What he, and I'm like, and I'm, and I'm talking to him, and he's just staring, staring at me. And he's like, you know, he's three years old. And he's giving me that icy look. You know, you remember when you're, you're staring at your, your kid at three, and they're looking like that, and you're thinking, he's going straight to jail. I know he is. <laughs> and I see that I see nothing's there. You ever had those conversations? You're like, what's going on? Is there a soul? Is there anything? I'm a failure, you know? And I'm just like, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. And I'm talking to him, and... And, and he just doesn't care, you know? I mean, there was discipline. He didn't care. He just didn't care. And I'm like talking to him. And, and, and I think it was maybe, maybe it's four or five actually. But because I remember talking through the gospel. I remember saying, so, is, so you actually loved your friend more than your mom? And I'm talking through the gospel. And you love your friend more than Jesus? And it was like one of those little moments where even at a, it, the light bulb went on. And all of a sudden he goes, but I do love Jesus. And I do love him. And he, he just, just broke. And he falls on my shoulder and he's sobbing. Like, not the little whimper. You know, that sob. And I start crying. Because it was just, it was, it was some true, genuine repentance. Um, we want that kind of repentance. But we don't want to take the time to get there. And I think if we don't take the time to take our behavior... Figure out what we want. What do I not believe about God? And how is it I love myself more than Jesus? Then the sorry is just wor a word. It's, it's not connecting the dots between your sin and really the cross. Um, oops. I somehow. Oh. 
Did I judge you? Brother, I am a sinner. Will you please forgive me? You had it right on repentance, didn't you? I was wrong. Will you forgive me? True, genuine repentance. I mean it. You know, God reveals my lack of obedience, and I, I'm to come to a humble repentance. Christians are to be broken over the wrong view of God and their love for self. You see, for, for us just to like um, rush into consequentialism, stop it, like bad things going to happen, then, then what are you sorry about? You're sorry about the consequences that are coming. You're sorry about the fact that you aren't going to have good things to come. But when you connect the dots with the character of God, and you connect the dots between Jesus dying on the cross, now it's this genuine agreement of God about your sin. It's to say the same thing that God says. It's, it's 1 John 1, it, it just tells us of what fellowship is. It talks about a relationship with Christ. It talks about what, what, a, what this fellowship is. And he goes like this. He goes, and if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's this, this really this depth of, of really forgiveness that comes with agreeing with God about what he says. Psalm 51, um, David, that Old Testament saint. He messed up. He commits adultery. He commits murder. Do you know in Psalm 51, 35 times there's a personal pronoun? Man, I, I remember as a sophomore in college coming across Psalm 51 for the first time and reading it and just being like, oh. <laughs> I have sinned against God. And I was like, that, that, that Psalm was such a ministry to me. And all the personal pronouns. Um, I can think of a circumstance where there was something and I, I did something or whatever. And I, I was kind of like, oh, dear Lord, please forgive me. And I was talking to one of my buddies about it like two months later. And he, said, and he asked a couple questions about it. And all of a sudden the reality, the reality of that sin. And I remember the difference between just saying sorry and, and the, the reality of actually dealing with and agreeing with God. There's no blame shifting. There's no room for excuses. There's no room for denial in true confession. You know, have you ever noticed how many excuses you can come up with when it's time to ask for forgiveness? I'm sorry, I, I just said that because... I'm sorry, I just did that because you... I'm sorry because, well, I, I don't want to have something bad happen to me. No, just agree with God. But, but when you connect the dots between your sin, your behavior, your desires, the attributes of God, and you actually let it settle into your soul, I love that sin more than I love Jesus. I love that sin more... There can be that genuine repentance, that genuine confession of sin where your, your godly affections are stirred up. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, he talked a lot about godly affections and he said, our affections are connected to our will. It's like this, it's like if somebody shouts fire over there and our children are in there, right? What do we do? We just, our will jumps up and our, and our affections are engaged. And it's even before we mentally really have understood everything about where the fire is and all that kind of stuff. And he says, that's the kind of zeal and, and that's the type of repentance and that's the type of, 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 of godly affections you want towards God. It's like, I love you and I, I'm sorry and I, I just want you and I, I want to obey you and I want my whole heart to go after you. So what are we cultivating? Remember, it's God who actually counsels us. It's God who actually changes us. It's God who actually changes those people we're responsible for. And so when we're cultivating the, the, the uh, you know, what, what, what do I really want my sin? I mean, excuse me. Um, what's the real problem? I'm cultivating honesty. What am I cultivating here? You remember? We wrote it down. What? Humility. That I'm actually being honest about my sin. Um... Do you know what's so sweet about true godly repentance? It's, it's the gateway. It's the gateway to grace. James. What does he say? God resists the problem gives grace to who? The humble. The broken. And that's why later on in James he says, Be afflicted, mourn, let your laughter turn to mourning, and your joy turn to heaviness. He's like, be afflicted, mourn, just 
Just repent over that double-mindedness. That's what's going on in James. There's two directions that this James, uh, the, 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 the recipient of James wants to go. Two directions. I want to somehow be perceived as I serve God, and I want to go do my own idol. And he says, you spiritual, you spiritual adulterers, you're in a spiritual relationship with God, yet you're looking for satisfaction in all the wrong places. He's like, no, 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 no. And that's what true, true repentance is really this confession of sin, agreeing with God about our sin. And then, and then it's, it's deeper that true biblical repentance is actually a forsaking of our sin. It's like what I know of sin, I run from. What I know of that is I am fleeing from. Ephesians talks about this. It talks about it positionally. He says in Ephesians 4, basically saying in Christ, there's a, my position is I put off sin and I put on Jesus Christ. But I'm to be renewed in the knowledge of the same. It's like I am to, in, in Colossians, he talks about mortifying sin. And the idea there is I'm to be killing that which is already dead. It's this, it's this constant understanding of, you know what? I, not only do I agree with God that that's sinful, but I run from it. And I do whatever it takes to flee from it. Put off those things, the old life. Put on the attributes of the new man. Flee that which would lead you back to the old life. And be reconciled to those that are affected by my sin. Um, uh, do you know, um, our kids catch more than we um, realize, don't they? Um, we, you ever told your kid to do something that you didn't want to do personally? <laughs> you know what they need? They need, they need to see true Christians. They need, to, they need to be told they need to repent, but they, they, need to, they need to model. You know what? Our kids see our sin, especially, you know, it's like when they're younger. Isn't it funner when they're younger? Because you can kind of like, they didn't see that one. <laughs> More fun when they're younger, I should say. But I'm telling you, I can't, I, I can't get away with anything. My kids, a couple of my kids are so like piercingly observant too. They just are like, Dad, did you mean to do that? Because it seemed like when you did that, that actually what you were saying was, <laughs> shut your mouth. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and I think that sometimes we're, we're wanting them to, to repent when we don't want to model what repentance should be. As we're working through our own idols in our own life, and if something gets expressed, if something, if your anger is public, in the family, don't you think the circle of your confession should match, match the circle of your offense? I mean, there, there's things that are happening in private you don't need to confess. But true biblical repentance, it results in you leaving your gift at the altar and making sure you reconcile with that one that you're offended with. Um, ungodly, uh, like unbiblical repentance or confession, I should say, or reconciliation. I've, I have this, I've had, I've, just by nature of what I've done over the years of the types of ministries, I, I get some, some wacky stories. You know, I had, I had one guy at a summer camp once, he came up to me after, I worked with all these kids all summer long, like 150 staffers, and this kid came up to me at the end of the summer and goes, you know what, God really did a work in my life. I hated you all summer, but I don't now, and I'm just so thankful that God really worked in my life. I'm like, well, I hate you now. No. <laughs> okay, that was unbiblical confession. I had no clue. I don't. Now I'm so. You know, every time I see him, he does. He's got. He's got freedom. But every time I see him, I'm like, he hated me for a summer. I don't even know why. <laughs> that wasn't helpful, was it? But you know what? It's amazing what our kids see. You, you say something negative about your spouse. Publicly, you probably need to ask for forgiveness. You, um, you don't keep a promise and you know about it, you probably need to ask for forgiveness. You, um, you get angry, you probably need to ask for forgiveness. You lie, you, better, you probably better just tell them. You know? How, how are they going to know what to do if you don't model it? We'll talk about that a little bit more in the dis making little disciples of Jesus Christ tomorrow. But so it starts with um, so the first step. What we don't we want we want to recognize the real problem. Get down to the real root. What is driving this? How is that I love myself more than Jesus? What attribute of God do I do I not believe in? 
And when that happens, then that second step is just natural. You don't have to spiritually half, half Nelson somebody down like the, the figurative aisle. Ha, ha, have you ever been in a sermon before where the guy's saying like 25,000 stanzas of an imitation song? Have you ever done, I, I grew up in a church where sometimes there'd be like lots and lots of stanzas of like just as I am. And it's like trying to get you to come down the aisle and you're hoping somebody would go just so we could go home and eat lunch, right? <laughs> Um, but if you really, if you really are broken over the fact that you love yourself more than Jesus, nobody's got to drag you down the figurative aisle. And the same is true with our kids. If we're taking the time to walk them through what's going on and they have a, there, there's a Christ in them and there's an appetite for these things. And soon what begins to happen is, is you're connecting the dots and we can start doing that at a young age. We start connecting the dots between what they did and how it offends God and how it's only met by grace through Jesus Christ. And we can begin that young teaching and modeling what true biblical repentance is. But then um, it brings us to this. Um, remember my position in Jesus Christ. Um, so in this counseling process, I can see my sinful it is. I can repent. But my ability to continue on in walking with the Lord is because of my position in Jesus Christ. There are many passages of Scripture that communicate that the Christian's position in Christ, at what the Christian's position in Christ is. And, and through Christ, the Christian is no longer controlled by sin. He's freed from sin and the law. Our identification is with Christ. And that's the reason why we can live in motivation to live a life that's obedient and pleasing to God. So, so if I'm not careful, what can happen is, is we can burrow down and see what the idol is and we can get to the repentance and then all of a sudden what I can do is I can almost like start communicating and keep on doing this. Do the best you can. You just keep on trying. And what I would like to suggest is that my ability to, to seek God, love God, and run from sin is because of what I have in Jesus Christ. Now, um, there are a number of positional passages Second Peter, um, and, and what I'd like to do is I'd like to suggest, that, that, by the way, that's your last point on there in your notes, like letter C, I think. It's like, um, yeah, look at letter C. We'll go back and work our way through Colossians. But if you look at letter C, Second Peter 1 says, diligently add to your faith, and then he just lists this whole list of virtues, but the basis is you have all things that pertain to life and godliness in Christ Jesus. Then you've got um, 1 John 1 that says, hey, the same Jesus that John uh, was, was next to, he walked with, is the same Jesus that's in you. And because you can have fellowship with Jesus, you can actually love others. Romans 6, 7, and 8. In Romans 6, verse 6, he says this, know your position in Jesus Christ. Know that at salvation you died with Christ to sin. And he goes on in verse 9 and says, and you've been resurrected to a new life in Christ. And then Romans 7, he talks about what life is trying to live under the law. And he tells us how that in Christ, that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Romans chapter 8. Now in Galatians 5, he says this, we have freedom in Christ. Only don't use your freedom as an occasion of flat, as a flesh, but by love, serve one another. Walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Ephesians 4, we kind of touched on it just a little bit ago, where it says you, you put off the old man, you put on the new man, and in Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. So I'm telling you all these passages because somewhere in your own Christian life, you are going to have to understand what do you have in Jesus Christ? And what does your position in Christ result in? Can I just be super frank the reason why I can forgive somebody is because Jesus died on the cross and he dwells in me and through his power, just like I have been forgiven by God, I can forgive others. Okay. What, it, what this means is because Jesus Christ dwells in me, the chains of immorality have been broken and I don't have to be a pornographer. Okay. Because of Jesus Christ, Dying on the cross, being buried, being raised from the dead, and at salvation, I was brought into union with him. What that means is, is I don't have to gossip. 
I, I don't have to lie about another person because I'm actually secure in God so I don't have to find my security in tearing somebody else down. Do you, do you see what we're doing here? We're, what we're doing is we're taking the gospel, which, which I know at your church, there's a, there's a connection. I saw people walking around with, with books that call the gospel primer and other books that talk about your position in Christ. What I love about those books back there, I mean, they're not like try harder parenting books. I've read plenty of try harder parenting books. Most of those books have some connection to what you have in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The death, the burial, and the resurrection that took place 2,000 years ago at salvation, you were brought in a union with Christ. So, so you died to sin when Christ died to sin. And you, you've been raised to newness of life when Christ was raised to newness of life. And what this means is we can do right not because of our own moral strength. We can do right because Jesus dwells in us through the Spirit of God. His righteousness is our righteousness. And what I'm trying to communicate is these truths for for our kids to understand these truths, we must understand these truths. Like, have you ever had somebody ask you a really hard question, theologically, and you're like, and you're trying to explain it, and you actually say the phrase, well, you know what I mean. Do you know what you mean when you say you know what I mean? You mean, I don't know what I mean. But do you know what I mean that I don't know what I mean? I had this guy ask me about the Trinity. I'm like just going, blur, 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 trying to explain it. He's like, I'm like, you don't get what I'm saying. And if you don't get what I'm saying, it means I don't get what I'm saying. And can I just tell you, you want to devour the gospel of Jesus Christ. You want to eat it. You want to think about it. You want to talk about it. You want it to so permeate who you are so that you can communicate to your kid and it just bleeds out. Like, like I think sometimes we think that what's going to happen at the crisis moment, that I'm going to have like the perfect little words to say, you know, I've never said the exact same thing to my kid, but I'm saying the exact same thing. Do you know what I mean by when I say that? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an exact little setup of words. But if I really believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and I'm trying to understand it and I'm packing it in my brain, can I tell you what's going to come out when I speak to my kid? The gospel power of Jesus Christ. And so what you're going to read, if you read any of those books, you know, there's going to be helpful techniques and there's going to be things about idols and there's going to be things about character development and there's going to be things about consistency. But you know what the, the common thread is? The gospel power of Jesus Christ. So, so as we're actually counseling ourselves, we're trying to cultivate honesty and then we're trying to cultivate um, in our life, uh, we're supposed to cultivate humility. But what are we trying to cultivate when we talk about the gospel power of Jesus Christ. What are we cultivating? Faith. And the just shall live by faith. And what we're doing is, is we're trying to communicate that you are never changed because of some, some moral capacity change of yourself. You are changed because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. That results in external change. Take your Bibles and turn to Colossians. If you were here the other night, you could re-listen to that message. If maybe they, they post that online, I'm sure that um, your pastor would even have other messages that, that would talk us through what is it that I have in Jesus Christ. Can I, can I recommend that you would re memorize sections out of Romans 6? Can, can I recommend that you would do some study out of Galatians chapter 5 and memorize some of it? And let these things become a part of your life. So, so in Colossians 3, he, he says it this way. He says, as a Christian... My ability to put to death, verse 5, what is in me. My ability not to lie, verse 9. My ability to, to dwell in unity. My ability, look down at Colossians 3, verse 18, by the way, if you've got that. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases God. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. My ability to do all those things at the end of Colossians 3. Can I tell you what my ability to do that is? Okay, look back at Colossians 3, verse 1. 
My ability not to provoke my kids, my ability to speak kind words to my wife, my ability is not because of my own moral capacity. He says, if, or you could translate that if as a sense. Since you've been raised with Christ, since you are in Jesus Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things at earth. Listen to this. For you have died. Past tense. Two past tense. You died with Christ. Past tense. You've been raised with Christ. Present tense. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. Future tense. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then will you also appear with him in glory. And this is what he's saying. He's saying, at salvation. Remember what we did? I said, how many of you say that you're in Christ? I said, I'm going to talk to you. The, the presupposition is that you really know Jesus Christ as your own Savior. At that point of salvation, when you ask the Lord to save you, when God turned the light on, when he did a work, when he saved you, you were brought into this union with Jesus Christ so that you're free from the power of sin. How many of you could say, well, I'm not what I ought to be? but I'm not what I used to be. I was here, what, three years ago, four years ago? And I can tell you what, this last, this, these, this last five years of our life, have, I mean, a lot of pounding, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of things. And I can tell you this, when I spoke at that pulpit this last week, it's kind of fun coming back to a, a familiar place because I remember what I was, I was thinking about some things about three and a half years ago. I can tell you something, congregation. <laughs> I can tell you something, moms and dads. I'm not. I'm not what I was even three and a half years ago. And it's not because of me. It's because Christ is in me. He's the one that's conquering sin. He's the one that's greater than sin. And he gives me the ability to say no to sin. And what, what this is doing, guys, is this is pulling down our conversations with our kids. We're pushing past the cons consequentialism. We're pushing past the moralism. We're pushing past all these things. And we're getting the gospel into their life for reals. And we know God's got to open up the, a, a tron light. Remember, that's why it doesn't say we're manufacturing the gospel. Remember what we did? I asked you and you said agriculture. That's what cultivate means. That's what, remember, we're just pushing seeds in the soil. Who brings life? And we're pushing those gospel seeds in. We're pushing those truths in. We're pushing those truths in. We're, we're watering. We can water, right? We can get more word in there. We can, uh, we can make sure the weeds don't get up and drown out the sunlight. But I'm telling you, I don't know how to do photosynthesis. Do you? But God does. And he's working in those little plants. He's working in those lives. And we take and we're constantly connecting the dots between behavior and idols and the necessity for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me just do a little side note here. How many of you um, have some kids that you just know don't know Christ as their Savior? Okay. Okay. How many of you have some kids that it just really seems that there's signs of grace and like it just seems like they really know Christ? Okay. And how many have some in the middle? That you just don't know. There maybe there's a profession, but you're like, man, if they got saved, I would I would not be shocked, right? Um, what's the answer for all three of those people? More Jesus. More Jesus and more gospel. You know, my kids, guys, we my kids every night of their life go into a children's program. Like like <laughs> my younger kids, every night. They hear about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. Can I tell you something? That's been scary for Christy and I. For our kids to hear gospel truth, that could, the same sun that softens the wax is the same sun that can harden the clay. And that's been scary. But you know what I found over the years? You know what my kids need every, every time? They just need more gospel. Like, like I got scared that they'd hear it and they'd just think of it as a story or just kind of like, oh, I've done, been there, done that. But you know what they've needed? You know what I found they needed? Sure, they've heard all those and maybe they tune out some of those stories. But I've had some of our kids that, man, just because they've heard the gospel so many times, they've made multiple professions of faith. And we just treat, every, you know, we've treated all the years. We're just like, oh, so you're putting your faith and trust in Jesus? Okay, is he doing a work in life? Well, man, we're going to trust God to do a work, aren't we? You know what's been so exciting to see? Is slowly over the years, 
it becomes more and more of reality. I was thinking our oldest, man, it's just great to see God just really get a hold of our heart these last couple months even. I was thinking of my, my, my fourth, and he just, he's so introspective and so like emotionally worked up. And he'd come to me like almost every night after hearing one of our team members give the gospel, Daddy, I don't know if I know Jesus as my Savior. Well, okay, well, let's talk through this. And I mean, I remember, remember one of these times, I was just, I was kind of weary. You ever get weary? I'm just, if I'm gonna put it out there, I want somebody at least to commiserate with me. Anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> And I, I was giving the gospel. I was kind of frustrated. I looked at him and said, David, where else can you go? You know, I don't know what else. I mean, he goes, right. <laughs> I was like, huh? I had to go somewhere early in the morning, come in for lunch. The first time I saw the kids, I was gone all morning. And, uh, David comes running up to me, and he goes like this. He goes, Dad, last night, God saved me. I go, what do you mean? He goes, I can only go to Jesus. He's the only one. It was like a, it was like massive light bulb. Like he's, he's been, he's really had, he's just kind of walked with Jesus since. We went home, I opened up the passage in John. We read it together. There's this, uh, uh, the Sovereign Grace version of, um, um, uh, the song, uh, they have a little bridge right in the middle, and it goes, where else can we go, where else can we go, you have the words of life. He and I are listening to that, we're crying, and um, it's the gospel, it's the good news. And you know, the things that frustrate you in parenting could actually be the most wonderful means of getting God's grace into your children's life. But we would rather just tell them to shut their mouth, wouldn't we? <laughs> We'd rather tell them, just go clean your room, just stop it. I'm going to take that away. And yet what, what actually could be is it could be a great opportunity to sit down and go, can I, can I, can I ask you a question? Why did you, why did you as a seven-year-old push your three-year-old brother down? Why did you as an 11-year-old say such unkind words to our unsaved neighbor? Usually what happens is we're mad, aren't we? Why did you say that? But, but when you're secure in God's love for you, you actually now have the, the capacity to say, no, can we talk? Because we need to figure out what, why did you do that? that? Does this man know Christ? No, he doesn't. Do you want to know Christ? Yes. So what do you want? What do you want? It's just when he, I just wanted to win and he was saying this and da, 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 da. So what do you want? And I want to win. I want to win more than love Jesus. I want to win more than my neighbor loving Jesus. You know, actually take the time to work your way down. Because what happens is, is now there's true repentance. And now you can get to your position in Christ. Now you can talk gospel again. And talk gospel again. And don't you think that's one of our primary responsibilities as a, as a Christian parent? Just to talk gospel to our kids. Over and over and over and over. I was just talking to... Uh, one of you all here during the break time and you're just sharing with me just the trial that you're in right now with your, one of your kids. Where else can you go with them but the gospel? When it really comes down to it, what else can, where else can you go but Jesus? And all the techniques and all the little things and all, eventually, you know what, it's just going to be Jesus. That, that Jesus is the one who saves. And so take advantage of, of these opportunities as much as they will allow you, as much as they have the capacity to understand, as much as you understand, that you'd understand really that it's the gospel power of Jesus Christ that saves us. We see the penalty. We see the power and one day the presence. But being saved from sin so that we can actually, and then this is the last one, we want to help those around us. We want to do this in our own life. Renew their relationship with God. As we remember our position in Christ, good thing I have a PowerPoint that I don't click through. That was helpful. Renew my relationship. So, so what is the goal? What do you want? Like, what would be your dream for your kid? What would be your dream? I want a kid that makes $2 million. Really? 
It'd be nice, they can support us more older, but really, what does it profit the man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What do you really want for your kid? You know, I heard it over here, what? To, to know and love Christ. Remember what I was saying, like the little mantra that Christy and I, we just were like, well, this is what we wanted, that they'd be saved. And number one, they just love God. Um, do you know the goal is, is that they know and walk with God? In, in, in uh, the Jewish, uh, uh, the Shema, you know what it was? Love God. It was, it was like walk with God. Like know God, fear God. Uh, what the two greatest commandments, love God. I mean, the, the goal of the Christian life, I mean, what was, what was the, the old timers wrote this way, that the purpose of man is what? Do you guys know what it was? The purpose of man was what? To know God, to walk God, to, to fear God, to glorify God forever. That's really <coughs> the purpose of man is to know God and glorify Him and enjoy Him. And there's this relationship with God. So at the core, if my sin, the root of my sin, remember what we did? We started with the behavior. We got down to the desires. We revealed the idol. We showed what I didn't believe about God. So if the root of my sin is actually found in my wrong view of God, it's, it's like I've got, there's a sense of I've got a mental problem. There's a sense of I'm not thinking correctly. I've got this wrong view of God, but I've also got an affection problem. I, I've got a, a love problem. So I've got a knowledge problem and I've got a heart problem. So, so in the correction, what, I, what do I want to do is I want to shore up the mental problem and I want to shore up the, the, the heart problem. I want to cultivate what? What do I want to cultivate? Love. So here I am with these little saplings of children and I'm pushing seeds in and I'm cultivating and I'm watering and I just want them to be honest. Would you just tell the truth? This is what you really want. I just want to cultivate humility. Yeah, you can't save yourself. And I want to cultivate faith, but Jesus can save you. And I want to cultivate love and you can actually enjoy God more than your sin. Idols will kill you, but Jesus will give you life. I want to cultivate a love for Christ. And so I want to re be renewed in my relationship with God by, by filling my, my mind with truth about the Bible from God. And this could be, uh, let me just give you some ideas. Study passages that describe God's attributes and character. Um, practically, mom and dads, that they're, um, the, this, is, uh, this takes place I love that first little video we watched with um, Thabiti and um, the two other guys, Josh Harris, and they're talking about a family altar time. You know, I, I don't know what your uh, thing is, uh, but is there a time in your child's life where they're hearing God's word from you? That's the goal. It's, it's, don't get lost in the, the actual form of it's got to be a certain time, certain day. That, it, that could, could be helpful for you. That discipline could be helpful. But does your child hear God's word from you? They need to hear God's word from you. And, and, and really where it's, it's just the atmosphere that you breathe. Some of you are going to be more planned. Some of you are going to be unplanned. Some of you are going to be like one-on-one. -on -one. Some of you are going to be corporate. But does God's word come out of your life into your child? Study passages that describe God's attributes and character. Um, you can build a biography of God. You can take the Psalms and just um, take, a, take a Psalm a day and write out. This would be one of the most easy ones to do, by the way. Uh, you write out a psalm. Um, we've never done this corporately as a family, but I know uh, some of our kids have done this. Um, I've done this, where it's just take a psalm and you write out who God is, and you write it down in a little journal and you pray back to God. And it's kind of read, I, read, write, and rejoice. And uh, build a biography of God. Fill your brain with big thoughts about who God is. Is if we'd run out of time, I was actually, we're not going to have that problem. I was going to actually take Psalm 23 and show us how to do that at the end. Um, listen to sermons and Bible teaching. Um, uh, you know what's fun is uh, uh, we, um, we listen to sermons together. Um, uh, we, we were uh, going to Yellowstone and we, our, we had a meeting that got done an hour away from Yellowstone. It was our last meeting. Wasn't that great? And so we said, well, let's go up to Yellowstone. So we went up there and I still remember driving through these beautiful mountains listening to some Tim Keller sermon. And it was about envy, and we're all talking about it as a family. And, and, and listen to sermons. Listen to 
listen to stories. I mean, there's, there's some really fun Christian authors that um, you could read stories to your kids that have Christian overtones. You could read like Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe or the uh, C.S. Lewis Narnia stories. And they got overtones of Christian uh, allegory and a Pilgrim's Progress. And, and there's, just, there's just so many different things that you can do to fill your kid's brain with truths from God's Word. But it, it's, um, it, it, it probably means that you love God's Word. Like it's really hard to, to coach your kids to have private devotions if you don't have private devotions. It's, it's hard to counsel your kid to, to read if you're not reading the Bible. Um, right now, in, in the season where I'm at, my, my kids are um, you know, in that, that teenage to exit stage. And I'm, I'm personally, my mornings, like it's not every morning, but, the, but in the last year, but, but most mornings, I'm with a kid, at least one of the kids, and I'm plowing through a Bible passage with them. And that's what I'm doing right now. That's, that's all I can do. I mean, I'm, like, I'm kind of done. I mean, I'm not going to tell them what to do anymore. You know what I mean? I'm getting that stage. They're not just going to do what I say. Um, they'll, they'll, I, I can't just con conform them, but I can sure get God's word in them. And you know what's been awesome to see is God's word changing their life. And, and do what it takes to get God's word in their life. It's been, uh, uh, I, this is one of those things I wish I would have probably started with all of them when they hit seventh grade. I wish I would have just started what's going on this year. I wish I would have started early, but, but I can. I don't have to live in regret that I didn't. I can just do it now. From now on, right? And it's been a joy. My, uh, Anna Grace and I are in Romans chapter 4. Man, we've been plowing through Romans. It's been so good. One, my boy, we just finished Galatians. And uh, he's just finishing up Psalm 119 on his own. He's going to come back. Another kid, we're, just, we're going through Job together. And I, and I thought, you know what? This is so sweet. But that's not law for you. That's just what's working for me. But you figure out, how are you going to get God's word in your kid's life? And I, um, we had a, I, have, I had a buddy, man, the four sons. No, maybe it was three sons. Three or four sons. I knew two of them that were really close. Their dad is kind of a bruiser. And um, he's a pastor. And the mom is, is just super sweet. But these kids would come work for us for camp. And they're pretty wild. And they're always on the edge. And uh, one was kind of rebellious all summer. And he came in. And, and, and he said, I got to talk to you. And I go, what's up? He goes, he goes I just, I can't live like this. I got to change. Da, 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 da. We're talking and God's just doing his work. And, and I go, what's going on? I mean, what was this change? I, I thought maybe it was like a sermon I preached or, you know, I was kind of fishing or whatever. And, and his kid goes like this. He goes, the verses. He's crying. The verses. My mom would always just pound verses in my brain all the time. The verses. <laughs> <laughs> I was just laughing. And, you know, isn't it sweet that he had a mama that pounded verses in his brain? So I don't know what your means is, but you've got to get God's word into their heart. And then cultivate a heart that loves and enjoys Christ more than sin. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, oh, I've got a couple legalists. Any of you have legalist kids? I was like looking at one of them. I said, you can't. It's, it's not about the rules. I was just telling this last week. I said, you've got to love Jesus. Somewhere in there has got to be a love for Jesus. It's not just avoiding the consequence. Uh, the other one, they, they, they want me to tell them explicitly what to do. Why? So they can honor God? No. So they can know explicitly what they don't have to do. I said, no, what is Galatians? Galatians says walk in the Spirit. And... It could be that you're supposed to give more than that. It could be you're supposed to do less than that. I don't know what you're supposed to do, but, but cultivate a heart that loves God so that you're able to discern and avoid the things in your life that rob you of your ability to enjoy Christ. You see, when, a, when, when, when they start tasting of Jesus, now when they're addicted to some electronic, now when they're addicted to some show, now when there's some show that's actually evil, they're, they're realizing, oh... One of the, the team members we were discipling came from a real controlling background. And, um, and he texts me. He goes, Will, I think I, I understand what you're trying to tell me. He was back home. So I'm sitting down. I'm watching a show, and it's got immorality in it. And he says, I just, I just got up, and I, I, just, I didn't watch it. And he said, because I just really 
have been enjoying walking with Jesus. I just don't want, I don't want to go like three or four days trying to like get that love back. And he goes, is that what you've been trying to tell me? I go, yes. Yes. You know, what if our kids just really love Jesus? I mean, like, they just really enjoyed him, and they actually walked with him, and they talked with him. And that's the goal that we're trying to get to, and that requires a disciplined yet devotional pursuit of God. It could be meditate on the sacrifice and the triumph of Christ. That would be a great study. It would be that you just, you know, it's that faithful devotions. I'm telling you, there's seasons with my kids where they're just worn out. You know, like, oh, I just don't get anything out of it. I'm like, me too. <laughs> and yet that disciplined and yet devotional pursuit of Christ to cultivate that relationship with God. So what are we trying to, what, what's the key word? That key word is cultivate. What are we trying to cultivate? The first one, the first step we're trying to cultivate is honesty. Then we're trying to cultivate humility, faith, and love. And, and when you love, now, now do you see what I mean by, though I communicate it to us linearly, li in a linear, linear fashion, how it actually, it could be that I'm just loving Jesus, and I, I say something evil, and I, and I just have genuine repentance. You know what I mean? It's not like i got to go back to the front, though. That might be the best way. Well, I did this. Why? Because I, I believe this, uh, 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 and I want this, because I, I don't really believe this about God, and, and I love myself more than Jesus, and so now there's true biblical repentance, and, and then there's that, my position in Christ, and then, and then really some homework to just pursue and know and love in Christ. Love Christ. Um, with this, we'll be done. One of my children just... Um, Really, um, that's their words. They just were saying stuff that's just so, so foolish. And I made them um, go through all of the Proverbs. And I just worked through and we worked through Proverbs. I, down, I, got, I got a list. I said, I want you to read through every one of these. I want you to just, let's start. What, is the, what does the Bible say about speaking? Um, too quick. Um, you know, that kind of homework stuff is what we should be doing for ourselves. How many of you can think of your own issue? Like, like even as we were talking through this kind of crisscrossing between your own life and your children's life, how many of you can think of your own issues? So why don't you set up your own homework? Your own homework to help you think right thoughts about God, about the attributes of God that you don't believe, and really cultivate a love for Jesus that's greater than a love for self, and really a, a gospel-centered or a, a grace-dependent view on God changing you. Isn't it good for us just to take some time this Friday night and talk about how we can change. And may God help us just see God do a work even in our own kids' lives. Father, thank you.